All right, and go back on mute if you please. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar on uh, farm radio, community radio, and participatory radio. Uh, Amy, can you go on mute for a moment? Okay. Thank you. Um... All right. Now, just like in the past webinars, uh, when I had to uh, practice on pronouncing participatory video for weeks, I uh, rehearsed uh, just as much uh, for this webinar, I think, on saying participatory radio. Uh, however, I have to give in to my mom, who has tried for the past 55 years to make me speak slower. Uh, she says, Peter, you're always talking so fast, uh, people don't understand you. But I am so fast when I get excited, and I get so easily excitable. Now, for today, I'm really, really excited, as our today's um, webinar topic is very, very dear to my heart. For many, many years, radio actually was a hobby of mine, being a radio amateur. Um, uh, and I actually started in a non-profit, the humanitarian world, um, while working as a radio technician many, many moons ago. So radio, in technical terms, um, is close to my genetics. But also, since back, I think, in 1994, I've seen the impact of community radios uh, when working back with International Red Cross and the uh, refugee camps, the Mozambican refugee camps in Malawi, to the post Rwanda uh, genocide uh, um, uh, refugee camps in Kivu. Um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, with over 2 million people, um, um, up to um, the, my more recent uh, experience with different farm radios I was able to visit in, um, in Africa. So excited I am indeed. As um, any and all of our webinars, this is the fruit of a collaboration between GFAR, the Global Forum on Agriculture Research, who are the organizers of this webinar and several of our partners and affiliated organizations and members of our GFAR communicators community. Particularly for this webinar, a big thanks to uh, Farm Radio International and Karen, uh, who pulled in a lot of the other presenters and organizations uh, you will see presenting today in this webinar. It shows to me how you know, GFAR works being a catalyst. You're all the, ma the machine, while we at the GFAR Secretariat were just the oil in the machine. Now, during this webinar, we do not have our usual man behind the scene, Giles Plummer, who is off in the field today, but we have the sparkling Emi Kiyobakira, who is the YPART communications manager um, in their global unit uh, here. Uh, YPART being the network of young professionals working in agriculture development. And if you're under 40, you work in the larger agriculture world and you're not connected to YPART yet, you really are missing out. Uh, Emmy will manage the slides and the technical aspect um, of the webinar. My name is Peter Kazi. I work in the comms team uh, at the GFAR Secretariat based uh, here in Rome. And I will be moderating your questions uh, today. And I have also the honor of introducing our speakers. But before we start, a word again on the logistics of this webinar. For this webinar, we're all connected through a service called BlueJeans, which allows everyone to see the presentation and those speakers with a webcam. Feedback, tips, questions should only be done via the chat box. So please mute your video and audio and keep it muted. Um, and as I was saying, there's somebody coming in and has their video on and their audio on. So please keep it muted. Otherwise, they will suck up a lot of bandwidth and it will interfere with um, other presenters. Um, even though we are with a big group, uh, we have over 100 registrations for this webinar. I would still like this session to be as interactive as possible. So I do encourage you and remarks, questions, and um, suggestions uh, during the presentations themselves using the chat box, the icon which you can find on the top right-hand side of your window. After the presentations, you will have the Q&A uh, session where we will have an opportunity to interact with uh, speakers. I will summarize your questions and pitch them to the individual um, uh, speakers and presenters. So if at any time during the presentations you had a question or suggestion or remark that pops up in your mind, just type it right in into the chat box and we'll go over them in the Q&A part. After this webinar, I will send you a mail with a link to the recording of the webinar itself, um, a copy to the link of the presentations, and some links to websites or resources we might have mentioned during the webinar, or some answers to questions we could not answer during the webinar itself. Now, however, without further ado, we go on to the topic of farm radio, community radio, and participatory radio. This webinar is actually a spin-off uh, from a webinar held in March 
on participatory communications and optic communications where Karen from uh, Farm Radio International presented Farm Radio as one of the examples of participatory communications. Now, after that webinar, we had lots of requests to organize a webinar specifically on Farm Radio, so here we are today. Now, the interesting part is that we're also going to highlight how Farm Radio or community radio can link up with other technologies and outreach or involve techniques to broaden our reach and deepen our impact. Um, next slide, um, Amy, if you please. The structure for today um, would be, um, first we'll have Ricardo del Castello from FAO, who will give an uh, intro on the rural um, uh, radio, community radio, with his experience at FAO and some of the work they've been doing with uh, FAO in um, the past years. Uh, he will be followed by Karen Hampson from Farm Radio International, who will cover Farm Radio specifically as a social learning tool. Then we'll have um, Rainbow Wilcox joining us from the UK. Um, Rainbow works with the Africa's Voices Foundation. She will introduce radio as a powerful two-way channel in combination also with other digital channels. And then we'll round up with last but not least, uh, Lucky Kumba, um, joining us from Well Told Story and Shujaz. We'll show how Shujaz uses radio and other techniques to inspire young people to engage in youth issues and in agriculture. And then we'll follow with the Q&A. Uh, Ricardo, you're up next, so if you can unmute audio and video, please. Um, we, and Amy, you can go to the next slide. Excellent. Um, Ricardo Castillo is a communication for development, a comdev officer at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO. He has more than 30 years of experience in participatory communication processes in agriculture and in rural development, with a specific focus on food security and nutrition. Ricardo has extensively worked in Africa and Eastern Europe for the development of communication strategies using multimedia approaches, the design and delivery of um, communications for development training, and the establishment of rural community radios and ICTs for agriculture research and advisory services. Um, take it on, Ricardo, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you, Peter, and uh, welcome to, um, to everyone. Uh, my presentation will give uh, an overview of uh, rural radios from the FAO perspective, but also talk a little bit about community radios. Um, I'll try to avoid as much as possible the word particip participatory, as Peter mentioned before. Um, but, and uh, I will also talk about some of the FAO experiences in, uh, in this field. I I'd like to start with uh, a quote from um, a dear friend of mine and also a colleague, Bruce Girard, uh, who uh, mentioned in the opening speech of the um, International Workshop of Farm Radio Broadcasting in 2001, um, he mentioned that radio in the West is just a piece of equipment that comes with the car when you buy one. But for most developing countries, and particularly in Africa, uh, radio is, uh, is an essential channel for bringing people together and also to bridge the gap between isolated and rural communities. Therefore, it's, it's an important development tool for sharing information and knowledge. But to share information and knowledge we have to have the, uh, the programs, we have to broadcast in the appropriate languages and appropriate formats for that particular context. And also, we have to broadcast up-to-date and locally relevant information. So, and rural radio has all the characteristics of a good development channel, which are proximity, trust, and knowledge. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, rural radio is a privileged media that belongs to the rural communities, and its objective is to facilitate access to useful knowledge and information, to enhance local expertise, to become familiarized with the social, lo uh, local social, economic, and health programs, and also to foster dialogue between the communities and their partners, and ultimately to share experiences, knowledge, and techniques, which will all um, enable all the, uh, the, the communities and their members to in interact and exchange. Next one. So um, we'll start just with uh, a, a couple of definitions just, just to clear the, um, the way here. Uh, rural radio is obviously a radio for the rural areas and uh, broadcasting topics that are local uh, to a local and uh, rural audience. Uh, 
it should be underlined that community radio is substantially different from the other two uh, main communication models, which are public uh, broadcasting and commercial broad broadcasting. Um, rural radio and community radio have been used interchangeably. Uh, there are other terminologies like cooperative radio, participatory, <laughs> there we go again, participatory radio, free radio, alternative, popular, and educational radio. But the basic underlining principle is that the radio is owned by the community for the community, for servicing the community. Next one. So, what are the characteristics of a rural radio? Uh, access and public participation in the production and the decision-making processes. The management of the station is in the hands of those who use it and uh, those who listen to it. And the, the, the organization of the radio also facilitates participation from the community. So uh, community, uh, volunteer work is, uh, is encouraged. There are targeted topics that respond to specific needs of the community. The, the, uh, there should be opportunities for training and also for providing feedback from the audience. It's a local focus, obvi obviously, and the coverage area is on the average of 25 to 60 kilometers and the transmitting power between 25 and 250 watts, even though there have been some cases where the coverage is much wider and the power of the transmitter is uh, much stronger. Next one. So from our experience, the establishment of rural community radios has, um, has to go, uh, has different, different elements that have to be taken into account. Um, these are, for instance, the, um, mostly to, to engage the community um, and to uh, have their participation, as I mentioned before, in the activities and the man management of the radio. So there is a, a series of awareness raising sessions that have to be carried out beforehand with the farmers, the associations, NGOs, CSOs, and also with the public authorities, because in certain countries, there should be a complementarity between public broadcasting, state uh, radio, and um, rural, uh, rural radios. The uh, setup of a management committee uh, that um, includes representatives of the different social and professional backgrounds in the communities, the building of the premises itself is also a participatory process whereby the community is involved in choosing the site and also in the actual construction of the premises. And uh, finally, the statute of a radio station, which is a, um, a guideline uh, to, um, uh, to allow for the, uh, the station to, uh, to function properly with a set of rules that uh, all the, uh, the members and the management committee have to adhere to. Next one. Uh, in the establishment of the rural and community radios, also the selection, purchase and installation of the equipment is important and has to take into account all the needs expressed by the community. So the choice of the radio equipment uh, to ensure that it's uh, technically suited for the, um, for the context, uh, climate conditions, location um, and um, everything else. And also the training of the radio personnel is very important. The training not only on the technical aspects, but also how to manage the radio, how to generate income, um, and, also, and also how to, uh, to produce programs, you know, how to, uh, to make them more uh, attractive and how to get the audience uh, uh, attention. The uh, elements of sustainability are important and the coverage of the radio signal is very important. So even before the radio is set in place, there has to be a need to test the, uh, uh, the width, the extension of the, uh, of the signal. Uh, suitable equipment again, so that you know, it's adapted to the various conditions. The operational costs, like you know, think of ways to mobilize resources like membership fees, community services, sale of SIM cards, etc. And also setting up a monitoring evaluation system. Uh, often uh, the audiences themselves, like for instance, listening groups are uh, set in place so that they can provide feedback on the content and also on the quality of the uh, programs that have been uh, broadcasted. Next slide. So uh, an important aspect is the needs assessment of the listeners. I mean, from the FAO uh, perspective, 
the topics that interest uh, the, uh, the audience will be the market prices, climate change, food security and health, but also human rights, gender issues and land rights and also peace building. Also, we're talking about a radio and it's the only mean of communication for the community. So entertainment as well plays an important part in the programming and in the um, transmission of, uh, of uh, rural radio programs. Next one. So the um, FAO has been working on a rural radio since the, uh, the 60s. And uh, based on this experience, FAO and also its partners, like uh, among them UNESCO and AMARC, the World Association of Community Radio Broadcasters, uh, have worked together in uh, various countries. And uh, since 1996, a, the methodology of rural radio has been uh, uh, formulated. And it's mostly a participatory and interactive methodology. Community participation is fundamental. Is a fundamental characteristic uh, characteristic of rural radio. In fact, it includes a lot of live shows, village debates, and uh, on location coverage of various events. What the community producers do at the the beginning is to familiarize themselves with the environment and with the communities that they have to work with. The next one, next step is engage in social interaction, like observe what the communities do. Uh, what the traditions are, what their cultural values are, and then engage in discussions mostly with the opinion leaders, in most cases the village chiefs, but also the local authorities, to start identifying some possible radio themes and subjects. And following this icebreaker, I could say, uh, the recording starts, the discussions, the interviews, statements, and also proverbs, local music, local culture. All of this is edited and then broadcasted over the, uh, the air. And the final stage is the monitoring or the evaluation of what has been uh, broadcasted and is face-to-face -face interaction with the, uh, with the audiences. Uh, next one. Uh, in our experience, we uh, have uh, found that the rural radio methodology is based on four main principles. The integration principle, which is a condition that is essential for rural radio stations to integrate all the concerns, as I mentioned before, health, nutrition, agricultural production, but also entertainment. The interdisciplinarity principle, principle which means that the teams that are trained have to be of an interdisciplinary nature, which means they should be not experts, but acquainted with all the topics that the radio is going to broadcast. The interactivity principle, meaning that the radio responds to real concerns of the community. And this is done through the needs assessment and through a continuous interaction with the audiences. And finally, the sustainability principle, which guarantees the continuity of the radio. So um, the uh, ability to uh, generate uh, local income, <clears throat> to keep the equipment running, because if people have to depend on the radio, uh, and that radio is the only source of information. If the, ra the radio is off the air for uh, more than a day, then that uh, interest in, in what is broadcast is, disappears and the, uh, the audience is, is lost. Uh, next one. And uh, a final slide just to, just to show what the uh, commitment of FAO has been in, uh, um, since 19, uh, the beginning of the 60s with the creation of the radio clubs and the establishment of rural radios in Africa. Throughout the years, we have also provided uh, uh, financial support for the establishment of the physical radio uh, station and also of the, uh, the training. Um, the most recent trends are not in uh, providing the full range of equipment, but mostly concentrating on training and using the local radios, the existing radios, even if they're private radios, but to give, to devote part of their broadcasting to um, community issues and to serve the purposes of the community by also involving the different members of the community in the production and the um, programming aspect. And uh, this is the end of uh, my presentation. Uh, in a nutshell, I've tried to uh, capture what rural radio uh, is and what our experience is, and I welcome your question at the end. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thanks, um, Ricardo. <clears throat> you can go on the audio and video mute again. Uh, Karen, you can unmute uh, your audio and video. 
um, for the next uh, presentation. Um, in the preparation of this um, webinar, Karen said, well, we can't have a webinar on farm radio or community radio unless if we um, listen in on an example on a piece. So as an experiment today, we'll just um, uh, give you a 20 seconds uh, snapshot of one of the rural radios. It's uh, Radio Free Africa and Radio Singarema. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Karen, this would be, I think, from Tanzania. All right. Correct. All right, here we go. now we're switching over to Karen Hansen, who is the regional programs manager with Farm Radio International, uh, FRI, a Canadian uh, NGO. She has over 20 years experience in international development, working with uh, farming communities on three continents in various guises. In her current role, she supports 50 radio and ICT projects in four countries of East and Southern Africa. The projects use the power and the reach of radio and ICTs to engage with listeners for various aims, to scale out the proven technologies, to promote uptake of agricultural innovations and improvements, or to assess the effectiveness of radio, ICTs, and other extension and communication for development methods. Uh, Karen also leads projects and partnership development in the region, building partnerships with various international organizations and research centers for effective impact projects. Um, Karen is based in Arusha, in Tanzania, at Farm Radio International's regional office for Sub-Saharan Africa. Karen, the floor is all yours. Go ahead. Thanks, Peter. I just want to check that everybody can hear me and say good afternoon. You're fine. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so yeah, from Peter's introduction, you can already understand that um, there's a lot going on with the radio. <laughs> there's a lot going on with radio. Um, uh, if we can move to the next slide already. Um, yeah, Farm Radio is a Canadian NGO. We've been in existence for about 30 years. We've changed quite a lot over that time, but what hasn't changed is our um, commitment to and belief in what radio can do. Um, and uh, it was great to have that introduction from Ricardo giving us kind of a theoretical basis and, because what I'm going to do hopefully is tell you a little bit about um, the more project-based work that Farm Radio International is involved in. Um, we work in uh, nine countries at the moment in Francophone West Africa and um, also in East Africa and we have our first project in Mozambique. Um, so uh, yes, obviously our focus is on uh, small-scale farmers. For example, and maternal health. So I suppose the first thing which um, Ricardo also touched on is, you know, why is radio good? Why does it work for uh, development and agricultural development specifically? Well, obviously, um, you can reach scale. I mean, the examples Ricardo were giving were of community radio stations, but we have worked with some regional radio stations, for example, in Ethiopia, which can reach, uh, you know, millions of potential listeners at a time. So it's obviously a fantastic way of reaching very dispersed and rural audiences. Um, uh, it obviously works best uh, in the preferred language of the audience, it builds on the oral tradition of many of the uh, of the audiences that we're working with. I think this is one of the strengths that sometimes is overlooked. You know, for those of us um, maybe with more of an, an urban or a background from um, not from Africa, we're used to having textbooks and written uh, ways of learning, but um, 
in some of the communities that we're reaching, that's not so true, where they're still very much um, based in the storytelling and oral tradition. So these are these are just some of the reasons you can probably add or think of some more why um, radio often works as an extension method for scaling up, uh, and is generally for you know uh, community outreach and communication for development. So can we have the next slide, please? Let's see, while that's coming up, um, yeah, the reason, that, the what I wanted, Go ahead. yeah, what I wanted to talk about a bit more really is how um, radio can be used as a social learning platform. So some people might think, oh, hang on, radio is one way, isn't it? Isn't it like uh, the presenter sitting in his studio with his headphones on um, talking? Like, well, yep. Yeah. That's one side of it. But the other side now is that with the internet, with uh, more people having mobile phones, of course, we can be very much more um, interactive. And um, in our own projects, we've discovered that the more interaction, uh, the better, really. It increases our impact and our results in terms of um, knowledge gained. In what our projects are about is trying to um, bring new ideas from the agricultural research centres to the farmers. So it's an, you know, it's kind of a, an, an extension of the extension services, if you like. So um, our radio strategies are not just for um, giving out information. It's not just about dissemination. When people talk to me about radio for dissemination, I quickly say, hold on, I don't like that word. <laughs> we try to talk about dialogue. So we try to use um, different ICT methods, mostly mobile phone based through beeping, through calling, to make um, loops and linkages uh, whereby the radio is the platform which, co which puts people in touch with one another. So farmers can call in to, radio, to our shows. Most of our shows have a weekly question format where we request uh, listeners to respond through a beep uh, or a missed call or flash, whatever you call it in your country. Um, and also, we have various methods of um, like sending out information. For example, in some projects, we've had um, farmers who want to buy planting material, and they'll send us a, a missed call, and by response, we'll send them an SMS back uh, with the list of seed suppliers in their region. So by kind of creating that linkage in that loop with input suppliers or um, uh, other extension offices in the region, it can be it can be very much used in that sense of, of linking people. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention a bit here is, uh, yeah, I've put on there room for doubt and discussion. I think that's, you know, that's one of the things that we try to do. We're not, the way we use radio in, in Farm Radio International is not trying to sell a product or not trying to, um, you know, uh, promote anything specific, but in in the sense that um, we're getting farmers to make their own decisions. We're giving farmers all the information, the pros and the cons, um, and leaving room there for, for dialogue and discussion and, and weekly questions. We're giving them room to air their doubts, room to discuss, uh, so that then, um, you know, they have their own fully informed, they're able to make their own fully informed decisions. So, um, yeah, we started doing um, these impact projects with interactive radio maybe 10 years ago now. So we've got quite a good body of evidence of what works and, and why it works. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we've found that the more interactive a program is, the results tend to be better in terms of knowledge gained or awareness or, or even uptake. Um, one uh, useful way of interacting with the listeners is to encourage listeners groups. These can sometimes be particularly useful for groups uh, like women who may have less access to radio or who may have less chance to be able to interact with radio. So in some of our projects, we've encouraged radio stations to subsidize the radio set for the group and in return, they will promise to send us by phone their weekly feedback. Um, 
So in that sense, we found that quite useful. And with listeners groups, you tend, again, to get slightly higher rates of interaction, then slightly higher rates of knowledge and, and impact in terms of uh, change in practice. It's because farmers are able to hear experiences from other farmers on the radio. They're able to contribute their experiences. Um, they're able to um, understand doubts of other farmers and respond to other farmers' questions. I think um, probably we're all aware and we all acknowledge that uh, farmers tend to prefer to learn from other farmers and listen from other farmers rather than uh, maybe an outside extension worker or, or scientist coming in and telling them what is the best course of action. Uh, it's this idea that you can sit down and discuss a radio program, think about it, uh, and then send your questions after hearing the program, send your questions back to that I should use garlic on my uh, army worms, but really is that effective? I've heard that this is better. So um, we found that um, in that sense, it's very much, uh, it's very much a two-way tool these days and it's very useful in that sense. Um, yeah, if we can shift on to the next slide. The only other thing I wanted to mention there is that it's also, radio can be very reactive because we're constantly trying to hear from our audience, we can very quickly shift the content of the radio. We did this, um, we've done this a couple of times recently, usually because of um, local climate or weather. For example, in Ethiopia, there was, uh, they'd experienced a severe shortage of rains. Um, some of our programs were, were talking about um, how to start planting, planting distances and so on. And the farmers called in and said, look, we're not planting it. There's no rain. So then we shifted very quickly to, uh, you know, what to do to conserve water, what to do to prepare. Um, and just we were just able to shift the programs and be responsive to what the farmers needed, uh, what kind of information and resources they needed at the time to support what was going on um, in their fields. So in that sense, it's great um, for the farmers. And, it's you know, it can also hold projects to account in some senses where you don't just kind of blindly go on. Uh, trying to achieve your stated outcomes or milestones, but you actually have to to, to listen to farmers and, and respond to what they need. So quickly, um, it's not the clearest visual in the world, but I just wanted to show you a very quick snapshot of the um, platform that Farm Radio International has developed internally. Um, this is a, a website where all the responses, all the respondents come come in. So the the presenter will say, this week's question is, which bean variety are you planting? Uh, for the Iringa variety, press one. For Kitenge, press two. For Rosy Coco, press three, and so on. So um, uh, the respondent will dial in. They'll get a missed call. And then they'll be able to uh, press the number on the phone that corresponds with their answer. And then when, the, when that's done, you can see in the left-hand column all the phone numbers come in, and sometimes we'll ask them to record their message for the radio station or their program. You know, sometimes that's just, hi, mom, how are you doing? Other times it's a technical question. So there we're gathering content and we're getting, we're getting feedback already. And then um, uh, we'll try and follow these up with a small SMS survey asking people where they are. Uh, and perhaps what sex they are and what they're growing. And then, as you see, that's a map of Tanzania. We can map where the responses come from. So that's, uh, you know, in that sense, then we're using radio as a data gathering. So it's quite effective um, to gather feedback about the program. Where are your listeners? Uh, what are they doing at the moment? And then you can ask them, you know, any question that you like. How is the radio program? Do, do we have enough farmers' voices on? Should we hear from women more often? so on and so forth. So that's a great platform to, to encourage interaction and to, and to gather data also. Okay, I think we can move on. Let's see what the next slide is. So yeah, that's, that's where we are at the moment. Um, we've, we're very much project-based, um, although of course we're thinking bigger. So I just wanted to spend the next few moments uh, talking about where we're looking at in future. So if we can have the next slide already, um, one of the issues that was already touched on by Ricardo also was the sustainability aspect. So um, 
Um, the issue often arises, yeah, that's great, you come in for a couple of years, you'll work with the station for a couple of years. You know, the radio stations, while they're community radio or whatever, a lot of them are run as businesses. They have to, you know, pay the bill or pay the license fees or the electricity. So um, this issue of sustainability uh, is one that's, you know, very much in our thoughts. And the way we're looking at it is to try and move to more network-based uh, working um, in the sense of we are looking to um, – looking looking at radio as more of a platform uh, to help uh, the public extension system. So we might work in a manner where um, we were able to um, network who need to be involved, such as the knowledge partners, the input suppliers, and so on, so that we could um, assist the radio stations, therefore, to be slightly more independent. This might take the form of business planning training, um, syndicated programming, um, centralised uh, radio craft training, for example, but also bringing in the wider actors. And I think the next slide um, is, a, is kind of uh, a picture, a visual representation of a bit more of what I'm talking about. So that you've got everybody in there who contributes to um, making this interactive rural radio work. Uh, you've got the farmers groups who will be asking questions, buyers and suppliers who will be there with their input supplies and maybe even with some um, uh, sponsors. You know, this would be a way of uh, influencing extension policy and and um, increasing the likelihood of radio being used as as a nationwide extension service. So that's where that's what we're looking to at the moment. I think uh, I think that's my last slide. In fact, so thanks very much for listening. Oh, we just have a slide of a presenter there. That's great. That's Clara from our Radio Five here in Arusha. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Excellent, um, um, Karen. Thank you um, very much. We have uh, quite a bit of, uh, of questions coming in already. I'm trying to keep track of uh, all of them. Um, the um, chat channel is where you can enter your questions. You can uh, browse through um, the previous questions and the remarks given. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Rainbow, I can see you're already unmuted. Excellent. Um, so we'll switch over to, uh, to the UK, to Rainbow Wilcox, um, who is Africa Voices uh, Foundation's Impact Learning and Communications Manager. Uh, Rainbow was uh, first involved with the uh, Africa Voices Foundation during its pilot phase as a student volunteer uh, while completing uh, an image fill in, uh, did I say this correct, uh, um, uh, Rainbow, in MP Phil? Um, it's, yeah, it's a master's, <laughs> master's in philosophy. Master in Philosophy and Development Studies at the University of Cambridge. Her role draws upon experiences in East Africa in the nonprofit sector and in communications, including with radio stations. She gained an understanding of uh, social science research methods during her psychology uh, bachelor's at the University College in London. Uh, we're all yours, Rainbow. Take it away. Great. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, and also thanks to Ricardo and Karen for setting the scene so well about the 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 power and the potential of radio and also Karen touching upon there the new ideas that can help to make to include more forms of technology and such as SMS and ICTs. So in my short presentation I wanted to touch upon how radio um, can be used as a research tool and particularly incorporating digital channels uh, and new technologies to amplify the voices uh, of ordinary citizens and in this context um, of farmers. So yes, thanks. Next slide. Um, Africa's Voices began as an applied research project at the University of Cambridge and radio has always been core to um, what we've been interested in. So it started out as looking at how can community radio spark conversations on development and governance issues and gather opinions um, from people from a, it was it was working in eight different countries, African, sub-Saharan African countries, 
um, and getting conversations going by allowing people to text in via SMS um, and, sh and share their, their views and then we broadcast those on the radio station. And from that original research, we've, we've evolved and developed and we're now a, a non-profit research organisation based in East Africa. So we have our office in Nairobi as well as in Cambridge and retaining those links with the university. Um, and why we do this, so like I mentioned, we want to, the moment so, so often the people's voices are missing from development and governance um, initiatives, in group, including agricultural projects. Um, and sometimes as a result, um, there can be things that are missed, which impact on the effectiveness of an intervention. So we want to try and understand people's views. And if you could just move to the next slide, please. Um, we work with various partners across East Africa and also moving beyond East Africa as well to help them understand various issues um, ranging from, so for example, with Oxfam in Kenya, we have helped them to understand uh, citizens' views on oil and gas developments in the northern part uh, in Turkana. Um, with Liberty in, Af in South Africa, helping them to understand what young people think on the municipal elections. And with Well Told Story, who you'll hear from um, after me, from Lucky, we've helped them to analyse and to understand all of the vast amounts of digital data they're receiving from their audiences. Um, and throughout this presentation, I'm going to focus on a case study of some of our work with UNICEF in Somalia, where interactive radio has been the core approach of that project of understanding people's views on a range of health beliefs. Um, and if you could move to the next slide. So the three core points I wanted to emphasize about using interactive radio as a, as a research approach is um, starting with a robust research design, ensuring that the engagement with the radio audience is, is meaningful, and also what do you do with all that data at the end, um, introducing some of our approaches to analysis. So next slide, please. Um, so, you know, we come from, uh, we have a, foundations in in research um, and we continue to try and make sure that all of our projects are grounded in a, a strong theoretical framework so we might start with a with our partner with with unicef or with oxfam to understand who who do they want to reach what do they need to understand and from our partners problems we can translate that into some research questions and help to develop some a, a robust research design that will ensure we're gathering appropriate and relevant data to meet uh, our needs and answer our questions. So moving on to the, the case study for this one. Um, so this was a pilot project we did, the first project we did with UNICEF Somalia in 2015. And we used a, an ex post facto design and the, the research questions for that, for this project were, Firstly, what are the differences between parents who vaccinate their children and those who do not? Um, and what are the differences between parents who seek appropriate health care during pregnancy for their, and for their babies and parents who do not? Um, so what we're really looking for is to gather data on people's beliefs, um, as well as their practices and their behaviour, how these are associated with each other, as well as how they're associated with social demographic groups. Move to the next slide, please. Um, engagement. So, yeah, engagement matters, and how it's done is really important. Um, and I think, as you know, other, as the other presenters have started to touch upon, to generate a, a lively conversation to get lots of different people um, participating, whether it's through call-ins or, or texting, texting in. Um, you need to put some careful planning into that and to, um, yeah, to test the script, to be engaged with the host. So 
our approach is we work with our research design and, and develop that into a citizen engagement um, design. Um, and the reason why radio is it continues to be so important is that there's it's a forum that can be trusted um, and there's spaces that, that, that are valued. And coming from a research perspective, they can be considered as as large scale fo focus groups where different beliefs and ideas are flowing from people from a diverse range of backgrounds. And importantly, we're meeting people on their own terms where they're already, they're already listening to radio. Um, text messaging is, is an increasingly and already very popular way of communicating. And it allows people to express themselves um, in their own language and in ways that they're comfortable with. Yeah, and next slide, please. So for our project um, in Somalia, we worked um, with our media partner, Media Inc, and with a network of radio stations, 20 radio stations across the country. We broadcast a series of eight programs, um, and each program focused on a different topic. Uh, for example, the question here, do you think that children in your community are at risk of polio? And we develop the, so the radio show questions, we develop in a way that they're open-ended and they're designed to spark a conversation. We ground them in social cognitive theory. So trying to understand how will these questions be interpreted by the audience? Um, thinking again, back to what data we are going to receive. And we also try to always test the, the questions and the scripts. And this is, important in in some projects where the script will need to be tailored for each community or each region that we're working in. Yes. And then secondly, um, still on the previous slide. Uh, yeah, thanks. So anyone that participates will then receive some follow up questions by SMS. And these are to gather their social demographics. So the gender, age, location, as well as if they're a parent, if in this um, case that was relevant, and also a question about their practices, their behaviours around the issue they were interested in. So an example here is, did your child receive the polio vaccination? And in this project, um, you can move to the next slide now, we received, um, we managed to reach a wide range of people and engaged a large diverse and a cross-section of society. Uh, we received messages from all provinces, provinces of Somalia and 44% of those were of participants were women, um, which we were you know, really excited about considering that most radio, interactive radio shows uh, are dominated by men, both in whether it's a call-in or whether it's texting in. Um, and if you can keep clicking, um, I think some quotes should come up to demonstrate some of the messages that we received. Thank you. And as you can get a, a bit of sense of here already, the, the messages we're receiving, because these questions that were posed by the radio host are open ended, can get some very rich um, answers and insights. So we're yeah, very pleased with the, the breadth and the depth of responses we got. And if you can move to the next slide, the, the volume and the, and the quantity of messages um, was quite high and it continued to grow over time. So the spikes there that you can see at the end, those are the last three um, radio shows of the eight radio shows. Several more, 72% um, of people participated more than once. And of the SMS questions that we sent out, there was a high response rate ranging from 70 to 80%. Of all of the messages that we received, um, after we cleaned them, so we removed some of the messages that perhaps just had one word or those messages of you know, saying hi to their mum, we had just over 19,000 messages from seven and a half thousand people that were appropriate to move on to the next stage uh, of our analysis. And if you can move to the next slide, please. OK, 
Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so as you may imagine, the, the data that's coming in is, is complex uh, and quite messy in nature. Um, sorry, just back one slide. Might be a delay. And thank you. So we need uh, quite a, a dynamic set of tools to help to process and analyze it. The way that we go about that is that we have a very a multidisciplinary and iterative process to um, analyzing the data and gaining insights from it. So we combine social science uh, with data science and uh, incorporate also a human understanding of the, um, the context and the language. So always working with native speakers. Um, so all of the data we're receiving is in local languages. It's often in, in slang, in text speak. Um, so it requires a lot of innovation in terms of how we make sense of it all. And I wanted to highlight a couple of the, the tools that we have for analysis. So on the next slide, we have a screenshot of an interface we use to explore the data. Um, this was designed in-house and it allows us to filter the messages that have come in by county, gender, age. We can search for keywords and this allows us to begin to get an understanding of what's in the data, what might the themes be. Um, and from that, that develops a, a framework to begin the, the qualitative analysis that would follow. And on the next slide is another screenshot from a crowdsourcing app, which we developed with our, for our work with Well Told Story. So this was to help us to label lots of textual data, which was in Sheng, which is a slang variant of Swahili. And by getting users to, to label the different messages that are coming in, in terms of what is the what is the topic, what is it about, um, what is the sentiment, we can start to train our automatic uh, algorithms, machine learning algorithms, and throughout our analysis, there is this relationship between manual techniques, um, working with native speakers, and more automated data science techniques, and they learn and build upon each other to speed up our analysis to ensure it's accurate and always grounded in the realities um, of the language and of the context. So returning finally to the, the UNICEF case study, I wanted to highlight one of our findings that we gained from, um, so starting from the research design through to the engagement. And finally, one of the, the insights that we got that we then presented to UNICEF in our reports was that those who perceived a risk of polio in their own community were twice as likely to, uh, for their children, it was twice as likely their children were vaccinated against polio. Um, and this was interesting in that it shows that the, the, the interventions and the programs that UNICEF is um, implementing to reduce polio need to move beyond just talking about uh, what are the symptoms and the transmission of polio but also what are the likelihood that a, um, a child will, will catch the disease or what, for example, what is the risk? And by targeting, by increasing the perceived risk of polio, we hope that the vaccination levels will also increase. Yeah, so that concludes my presentation. And I hope you'll get a sense of how interactive radio, so radio combined with SMS, uh, can be used as a research tool. We're also exploring other methods of gathering data, so through IVR, which is interactive voice uh, response. Um, and perhaps for some of you, you might be wondering why I've just been talking about polio vaccinations and health in Somalia when this is a agricultural forum. Um, we we are, have been in conversations with um, agricultural organizations as well as Farm Radio International uh, in anticipation of upcoming projects related to agriculture. Uh, we think that our methods and our approach would be relevant across a wide range of, of 
agricultural and farm related issues. So we're, we're really clean, keen to explore and to amplify some of those um, farmers voices across the continent. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. All right, thanks, um, uh, Rainbow. Um, thanks for highlighting the use of, uh, of radio and community radio um, uh, in the research. I'll be looking forward to um, uh, how you will uh, implement this in, um, in farm and agriculture. I see Lucky is already coming uh, online and unmuting. Uh, Lucky Komba, also known as Alan Lucky, is a media personality, a media consultant, and an education activist and a digital expert who's been in the communications industry for 12 years. He started with the exper um, experiential um, marketing uh, campaigns in 2005 and eventually made an entry into TV and radio career in the East Africa television uh, in 2008. He was amongst the founders of the most famous high school TV, TV show in Tanzania in 2009 called Skonga, uh, which still airs on East Africa TV. Now, Lucky is currently part of a team of creative minds at Well Told Story Limited as a senior media producer for Sujaz. Uh, for those who don't know Sujaz, Sujaz is a two times um, Emmy award winning multimedia communications platform that helps to improve the lives and livelihoods of young people in uh, Africa. Uh, Lucky has a wealth of experience in dealing with young people and handling matters related to them. In regards to this, he believes that young must be involved in finding solutions to their challenges. And I think, Lucky, this is how also your enthusiasm and your work in Sujas relates to. It's all yours, Lucky. Take it over. Thank you, Peter. Hi, everyone. Uh, my presentation today um, will mainly focus on how Shujaz uh, uses radio to encourage young people in Tanzania and, and, and Kenya uh, to engage themselves in agriculture. So, uh, but before that, let me just uh, give you a sneak peek and, and on introduction, I mean, to introduce WTS, World Thought Story, and Shujaz as well. So, if you could go to the next slide, please. So, World Thought Story, we actually do uh, three things. Uh, one is research. We are harnessing. Uh, we 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 are doing that. We we are harnessing the power of research, but also we do media and strategic communication. So we have a part of us which is dealing with strategic communications, and Shujaz is a media part of it. And also we do a lot of research. Um, so Shujaz, as I said, I will focus mainly on Shujaz as a project a project on, on on media, and it is a unique multimedia platform uh, produced by. World Word Story, uh, which tells stories about young people to young people, uh, and this is mainly to inspire, give information, and create discussions uh, around different topics. So, how did we start radio, and what are the other platforms that we, we, we actually deal with? So, on this slide that you're looking at right now, these are different platforms that we are dealing with, but I'll tell you a story about how we started radio. So um, we have our main character, uh, which is DJ T in Tanzania and DJ B in Kenya. So this is a young boy of 19 years old, uh, just finished high school. Um, after finishing high school, he couldn't continue with studies, just like any other young people in, in East Africa. Uh, so, you know, they, they're facing a lot of uh, troubles in getting funds actually to get them to universities to continue doing things uh, and achieving their dreams in, in, in their lives. So this young person, this DJB, DJT in Tanzania, actually sat down and decided to look for means to actually communicate with other young people and to share ideas so that they can at least earn a living, at least do something for their societies because uh, the only uh, thing that is uh, many people in East Africa, in Africa, think that uh, someone, someone is successful is either through education or either uh, having a business somewhere. So, in fact, this young guy decided to uh, create a radio station from his bedroom. So, he had uh, some experience in electro electronics, so he decided to co collect some stuff and actually do uh, create a radio station from his bedroom. And he has the super fans, his friends, who are actually bringing him information, and he does uh, the show uh, from his bedroom. So he started by hacking airwaves with big radio stations, and later on, actually, everyone saw what he's, this guy is doing and invited them uh, 
I mean him and his friends uh, to their stations. So we, apart from radio, that is radio and that is the what I'm, I'm going to talk uh, a lot about. Uh, let me just introduce you to the comic. So we print uh, around 500 uh, uh, copies monthly uh, of comic in Tanzania and around 750,000 in Kenya. Uh, and we distribute these comics uh, for free. And these comics carry the story of Shujaz, the story of DJB, DJT in Tanzania and, and his friends and show opportunities around different areas that we focus on. Uh, and also we have more than 170 170,000 uh, SMS subscribers. Uh, we are also having a lot of WhatsApp groups, so we do a lot of conversation, just like uh, um, uh, other presenters have mentioned about uh, harnessing uh, uh, conversation. Um, and also we do group engagement. So in fact, in Tanzania right now, we've started uh, a particular campaign, we call it Guvu Moja. It's about bringing youth together, uh, doing things together. So we also want to, 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 to do a lot of activities around groups because uh, of the insight that we've been getting. Uh, young people in Tanzania and Kenya, they really like to be in groups and do things together and at least to get approvals from their peers and to get that, um, uh, uh, to, to cement whatever ideas they have with their friends. So we do a lot of groups as well. And we are big on social media, as you can see. Can we move please to the next slide? Yeah, so why why did we actually start uh, working on uh, agriculture on our radio? So we have been having our show. Uh, so we have uh, we have been having our radio show. Someone is interrupting. Well, go, go ahead. Um, um, I think there's somebody who's unmuted, and I have him. All, all yours again, um, uh, Lucky. Okay, okay, okay. So we have been having our radio show uh, on air uh, for two years now in Tanzania, and for over four years now in Kenya. But uh, through our radio show, as I said before, we've been uh, telling a lot of stories in different areas. But uh, we we. It, we, we, we know exactly from our data that uh, radio is the popular media among young people and it is very critical for us to, to leverage it. So uh, we decided to use agriculture uh, through, I mean to use radio uh, telling the stories around agriculture. So uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation challenged us to actually uh, work on enhancing youth perception towards the, 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 the attract, attractiveness and profit potential of agriculture. Uh, so our research shows that radio is still the most used media platform by youth, as I said before. 15 to 24 year olds in Tanzania, uh, they get news, uh, information, and entertainment. Uh, and thanks to Ricardo, who actually set up the motion before and explaining uh, how the radio is important. Uh, so uh, can we move to, to, the, to the next slide, please? So by getting that challenge from Guest Foundation, we decided to use this radio. And before you doing that, we decided to actually do something we call ground truthing. So for us, ground truthing is uh, a research that we do before we do before we make any kind of content. So before engaging the youth with content on radio or other Shujaz platforms, we do a research and then we have insights and then we move on uh, uh, making content. So through our initial research, we found out that youth uh, thought agriculture is not for them. So before it was like they needed motivation, they needed someone to tell them that agriculture is for you and there's money in agriculture. But also we found out that agriculture for them is something uh, that they can opt to do after they have failed in their lives. It's something of a last resort. So uh that's what we found out and then we we also found out that money matters a lot for for, for most of the youth in east africa and the big question is can they, can agriculture bring uh quick money can agriculture bring me money right but also we found out that social capital is very important so they need to feel uh, uh respected they need to be respected in their society they need to do something that a society can actually uh, respect them for, yeah, and they, they they also feel the need of being stars among other peers, yeah. 
So the big question was, if I do agriculture, can agriculture actually bring me that respect I need? Can agriculture actually make me star among my peers? But also we found out that uh, there's, there's the issue of community approvals and peer approvals. So if my friend is doing this, I can also do this. I, I can also do it. If my friend is not doing it, why should I do agriculture? So that's another thing that we found out. But also, uh, we also uh, found out the issue of uh, role models because most youth in East Africa, they have people uh, who influence them in, in all the things they're doing, making decisions, uh, you know, buying shoes. What kind of shoes can I, can I really buy? Uh, someone to influence me. Or maybe I saw this star on TV wearing a particular uh, kind of hat, so I, I had to go and, and buy it. So the big question is, do the role models influence me on agriculture? Do they do agriculture themselves? Yeah. And the last thing that we found out is about showing of success. So it's like, uh, what is it exactly I can get from agriculture? Is it a lifestyle of my dream? Can agriculture make me achieve my dreams? So those are the things that we actually found out before we started uh, doing uh, all this agriculture campaign on our radio show. We could move to the next slide, please. So all those findings, they helped us to create the strategy. So we, we, we had four kinds, uh, four different types of strategies when we started in Tanzania in 2000, 2015. And the first one was about telling young people that there's money in agriculture. It's, it's more of motivating them like there's money in agriculture because you want quick money and there's this way uh, you can use for you to get uh, the money that you need so we showed we, we told the stories through our media through co uh, comic book through radio through social media stories of young people who are actually making money in agriculture but also another strategy that we we employed after that is about uh, agriculture is not only for the people in the villages and the old people or agriculture is not for for for, for only people uh, for the people who failed in their lives so we wanted to show them that agriculture is for everyone and you can actually live the lifestyle of your dreams through agri agriculture and then we came to another strategy telling young people and showing young people that actually community and your friends they can approve whatever you do so if it's about family, it's about uh, friends, if, if it's about everyone in the community, people are okay with, 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 with you doing agriculture. So in fact, uh, it was telling the stories of people who can endorse agriculture and, who can, and also showing the case studies of people who are doing it around their own woods. So if I'm living in this street, uh, we were showing stories of people uh, in the same street, just like you, doing something around agriculture and making money out of it. Yeah, that's, that was another uh, another strategy. But also we, we, we decided again to employ another strategy later on, which is where we were working on it right now. It's about showing success from agriculture. So the stories that we are telling right now about people who have actually achieved something through agriculture, either they bought a car, they built a house, or maybe they've gone to school. So I have a couple of examples, uh, as you can see on the slides, uh, on the slide there. So we told a story about this young girl, as you can see her from the first photo. Her name is Petronilla. And this girl actually was working uh, in a bank. And she quit from a bank just to do agriculture because she, she saw how agriculture uh, can make her achieve her dreams. And now she's having her own company, uh, supplying food in Dar es Salaam and the nearby uh, cities. And after telling this story, many, many young people started now to see the opportunity in agriculture and starting asking a lot of questions, trying to get a lot of information. How can I start? How can I be like her? So we actually used her to motivate other young people and also to show that there's this way you can also earn a living and achieve your dreams. But also we have this young girl in in in, in, um, in there. Her name is Esther. Esther was given a land by his by her family just to produce food for the family. 
as you know, most uh, village people, they just produce food for their families, not for actually doing business or, or making money out of it. So she was given a, a land by her, by her father to produce food for the family. But she she, she decided to, she, she saw actually the, the, uh, the business opportunity by just getting that land. So she saw that opportunity. She decided to start uh, growing vegetables and selling to neighbors and then nearby streets, nearby towns. And now is actually uh, doing very good. She's leading a very good life in there right now because of agriculture. And she's big in there because she's even selling her vegetables to the nearby cities, not only in there itself, Sumbawanga, Iringa. She's getting a lot of orders. But also we told a story about uh, this young boy called Mohammed. Mohammed uh, is a student at uh, UDOM, University of Dodoma in Tanzania. So Mohammed, had, uh, his dream is to get a degree. He told us, I wanted to get a, de a degree. So we decided to tell his story through our media, through radio. And in fact, he couldn't get any money, just like the story of DJT and DJB. He couldn't get any money to, for him to go uh, to the university and actually uh, accommodate his studies at University of Dodoma. So what he decided to do, he decided to engage in agriculture and get money and pay for his education. So in fact, uh, this year he's in third year at UDO. Um, I can't remember the degree he's taking, but he's, he's, he's having, he's about to get, to achieve the dream uh, that he had before. And there are so many other dreams that he, uh, he has. And in fact, we're going to, to, to tell his story more uh, on East Africa Cup, which is coming up uh, this June in Moshi. But also we told another story on the other angle. You remember the findings that we said, uh, we found out that role models, do role models actually influence young people in East Africa to engage in agriculture? And we realized that there are so many stories that media don't cover about this role model. So they just cover about their stardom, what they do, what they wear, what music they make, you know, what club they went to last night. But in fact, they don't tell the people, the community, that this guy is making his money through agriculture as well. So he does music, but also he makes his money through agriculture. So we told a story of this famous musician in Tanzania, probably the richest musician in Tanzania, uh, called AY. So AY, a big chunk of his money is coming from agriculture, if you didn't know. And in fact, after we told this story, every young person who is a fan of this particular musician started to ask questions and say, and, 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 and requesting for more information around how did AY make it. Yeah. So telling all these stories and doing a research which actually made us uh, come up with all these strategies have made an impact in these two countries, Kenya and Tanzania, at the moment. Uh, could you please go to the next slide? So after doing it, uh, I'll speak mostly on, on about Tanzania because uh, I'm, I'm handling Tanzania business. So in Tanzania, we've been there for two years since we started with our radio show, one hour radio show on, on big stations. And uh, we had learnings before, but now uh, what we have learned so far after starting doing this, we still uh, see the need for young people to connect their dreams with agriculture. So we are trying to work around it. We are trying to create strategies around it so that the, the, these young people in Tanzania can see the need to connect agriculture with their dreams and see their dreams through agriculture. But also we have learned that there's little knowledge among youth regarding the value chain. So they only know that agriculture is to get, uh, to, to dig the farm in the village. They don't know about the whole value chain that you can transport uh, agricultural produce, you can sell uh, seeds, you can do this or do that within the value chain. They, they, so there's, there's a, that need uh, of, uh, of that information about markets, how to do it, what is best, where, etc. Et so all this kind of, of information, we still see that there's need uh, for us to do more around it. And we're working on different strategies to make sure that we give this information to the youth. 
and also trying to to to, to get more uh, partnership uh, to form more partnership with different organizations which has uh, which have all this information that we need but also we have learned that youth need more role models in agriculture so it's not just about the musicians the footballers the actors but it's about the family itself most people if you ask them like who is your role model they say it's my mom or it's my um, my, my dad so even the parents need to show their kids that there's something in agriculture you can do agriculture and actually uh, live the life of, of your dreams even the successful peers around so among our strategies i said we show success so if we if we tell a story of a, a of a guy from your street we actually talk about how he has um, uh, achieved something in his life through agriculture so it's about success but also we have learned agriculture is still a risky business for you. We have been hearing a lot of information about it, maybe the rainfall, there's a, there's a problem with the rains, or maybe if you grow this kind of crop in this particular area, you won't get enough yields. So there's still, it's still risky business because there's lack of that information and lack of people to help these young people. That's what we, we, we have learned so far right now. And still money matters. So if agriculture could give me money every day, I could be, you know, engage in agriculture. So we need also, uh, uh, we're trying so hard to work around it to make sure that young people see the opportunities in agriculture and actually can make money through that because money still matters for young people. And as, uh, as I've been uh, insisting that our aim is to continue to work with you through radio, uh, addressing the issues, all these issues about information, uh, connect your dreams with agriculture. It's not risky to do agriculture. You can get money through agriculture. So we, we th that's a uh, that's our aim to continue doing that. Uh, next slide, please. So on this one, I would like to to uh, uh, show how uh, successful our programs and our campaigns have been uh, so far. So just taking you back a little bit. Uh, as I said, we launched to jazz in Tanzania in 2015, uh, the month of March. And we just started with uh, 70,000 comic books. We didn't have a radio show before. And we started our radio show in November 2015. So it's just uh, um, a span of two years since we started. So we did our annual survey in 2016 and our reach was 9%, as you can see on the screen right there. Out of these 9% people, uh, young people, 15 to 24 year old, 7% uh, of them, actually they've used to just either once or twice, but the monthly users were 2%. But we, uh, last year, uh, in December, uh, findings, we, we got findings in January this year, in 2017, the reach has gone up from 9% now to 23%. And monthly users are 11%. So for us, it's very big. And this is, we, we see it's a huge success for us as, uh, from when we started and how we do it. And also even the feedback that we've been getting. So our, our national survey also shows that more youth have seen opportunities around agriculture and also been motivated. So if you could, uh, um, you could also see through the uh, the feedback we're getting, the conversations around our social media. There's that positive change. When when the, when we we were discussing about agriculture in 2015, big percent had negative perception towards it. But now when we talk about agriculture, big percent have positive perception about it on our social media, on our feedback channel. So you could see how the mindset have been shifted. Uh, through whatever we do, through the strategies that we have. But also more youth among our users have expressed a desire to engage in agriculture. So in 2016, the, the, the national survey that we did to 13%, these are the 13% 13, 13 people, uh, uh, people uh, among our target audience who actually showed uh, desire to engage in agriculture. But in 2017, now that has increased to 19%. Who knows what will happen in next year 
or in the next five years. So basically that is it. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, and thank you so much for this opportunity. <laughs> Excellent, uh, Lucky. You can go on mute, um, video and audio mute. Um, it, it's really uh, interesting to see an update on Sujas. Um, uh, I think the first time that I, I heard about the program was back in 2009, 2010, um, where they were just starting to get involved in agriculture, uh, coming from a youth program. And it's, see, it's really interesting to see how it has evolved and spread um, and the, um, the reach and the impact it, it had. We had um, a lot of questions coming and going from very technical and legal questions to practical um, uh, questions. So we go through the um, uh, different um, questions uh, presenter by presenter. Um, I'll give you for the presenters, I'll give you a head up if a question is coming your way. So you unmute. Uh, I would suggest you unmute your audio only so we can save a little bit of bandwidth. Um, Ricardo, the first one is coming up uh, for you. Um, it's a question that came in from Hilde Kuhn. Um, Ricardo, uh, what is FEO doing if the necessary funds can no longer be raised uh, locally? Given the important role of uh, rural radio, uh, one would suppose there is a support fund of some, uh, some kind. Um, I would also um, like to tell the other presenters if they want to pitch in to answering a question that I'm giving to one presenter, please unmute and just uh, pick in as if we were be sitting on a podium. Uh, Ricardo, so what is FEO doing? Um, or is there a general um, uh, fund on support going beyond the initial uh, cost of setting up a support fund uh, for rural and community radio? Go ahead. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, and thanks to uh, Hilde for the, uh, for the question. Um, Yes, I could answer right away. Unfortunately, not. There is not some kind of a revolving fund which provides ongoing support to, uh, to rural uh, um, community radio stations. Um, FAO also does not have a program on rural radio. Um, I don't know if um, uh, our audience knows that FAO is a UN organization. It's an implementing organization. It's not a funding agency. Therefore, it works with governments and with donors uh, to implement a project. So the, um, the support given to a, a given um, to a country uh, with regards to radio is only limited to the, uh, to the period of the, uh, the project life. Uh, having said that, uh, I, um, I should add that, and, and I could, could not stress this uh, enough, the needs assessment is very, very important for the sustainability of the radio. Uh, and when we talk about sustainability, um, sorry, and when we talk about needs assessment, it's not just in terms of content, information, uh, languages, broadcasting times, and so forth, but also that all the conditions for the sustainability of the radio are met. And these include the uh, willingness of the community to support the project, also to uh, do a, a market analysis, see what are the sources of revenue. Uh, in uh, many uh, West African countries, the communique, the, um, uh, what would you call it, the uh, notices, uh, you know, births, deaths, weddings, uh, and so forth, are a source of income because people pay for that information. And also, let's not forget, at least in our context of rural radio, uh, addressed to rural communities in isolated areas, radio is the only source of information. Um, and when I say that, I also mean that it's information also about market prices. Uh, farmers have to displace themselves quite a few uh, kilometers in order to go to the nearest collection point, uh, either for, um, uh, for crops or for their products. So knowing in advance what the prices are, what the market prices are, uh, where the uh, the products can be uh, sold, uh, it, it's it's vital information for them. And uh, and if the information is useful, um, they're also willing to pay for it. Obviously, with you know keeping you know a word of caution, you know there are differences between various environments. But this is what we learn in terms of uh, sustainability. Um, I'll, I'll stop there because then there were, I noticed there were other questions that maybe will be addressed later on. 
Sure, thanks, um, Ricardo. You can mute again. Karen, I want to um, also bring this question over to you. Um, and it's related to um, um, the, um, I think there were two of our um, webinar participants who said, listen, um, I would like to start up a community radio. There was one example in Nigeria and one example uh, of a participant in uh, Uganda. Um, who said, I want to set up a community radio. Where do I start? Um, uh, on whose door do I knock for funding, for uh, support? Um, is it something that Farm Radio International, for instance, does? Um, or are there foundations where people can plug in? Uh, Karen, if you can unmute your audio only. Go ahead, uh, Karen. Um, yeah, thanks, Peter. No, it's not really something that Farm Radio is involved in, the starting up of radio stations, because it can be you know, it can be quite complex. Usually, um, one of the key things you need is a license from the government, some kind of licensing arrangement. Um, and then, of course, you need the basic uh, equipment and so on and so forth. So it's not um, it's not been something that we've been involved in the startup. Um, and I think, it, you know, it differs a lot country by country. Maybe Ricardo knows a bit more than me, but... Um, uh, I know there are some very small radio stations operating, so it's very well possible to start small, obviously. But I'm afraid I, uh, it's not something that we're involved in. Yeah, um, uh, maybe Ricardo, it comes back to you. Um, um, on, on whose door would people um, knock if we have, I think it's John and um, um, uh, Kaganga, uh, Nigeria and Uganda in these examples, where would they knock? Would they actually go? Would it, would it be more practical to go and knock on a commercial radio station and try to get some air slots? Um, or um, um, where would people go if they actually want to start a very small radius um, um, local community uh, radio? Practically, um, where do people go? Um, uh, Ricardo, back to you. Um, a, um... As I mentioned before, you know, we work with uh, with governments uh, and also with national organizations. Uh, and I also mentioned in my presentation that, you know, the trend in the last few years has been to work with an existing radio. So even if it's a commercial radio, we will uh, come in and provide the, the training uh, on the various sustainability elements that I mentioned before. Uh, other agencies, at least within the UN system, are also supporting radio. I, mean, I could think of uh, UNICEF, UNDP, and uh, and UNESCO. But you know, again, another word of caution: we're all dealing with the same issues, you know, declining budgets and uh, lack of resources. So um, I think partnering with with organization, I think, would be the best way to uh, um, to resolve some of the, these issues. Um, Again, the situation is very complex and varies from country to country. Uh, but uh, there are various organizations that are specify, um, specifically uh, work on radio. And again, I can think of Alamark, for instance, that supports uh, um, the implementation of uh, uh, community radios. And that could be, you know, maybe one, uh, one starting point. Uh, and also within the governments, within governments, there is probably a possibility to uh, to find a, an opportunity to partner with other organizations. Okay, very good. Um, I, uh, we have some more detailed questions on licensing um, that probably uh, we'll uh, answer on um, on a follow up uh, email sent to all of the participants. Uh, um, um, thanks, Ricardo and uh, Karen. Uh, Rainbow, a question came in for you uh, from guest 18. Uh, if you can unmute um, uh, Rainbow, you you drew a parallel in your presentation between uh, radios and large scale focus group discussions. Now, how do you facilitate and moderate a discussion, which is really essential for any focus group discussions, when you're dealing with such a large volume of text and audio uh, inputs? Um, Rainbow, go ahead. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's a very good question. So firstly, I mean, one way we approach it is that we work very closely with the radio host, so that they really are the, the, the facilitator of the discussion. Um, and we work with them to ensure that the way in which they're talking to the audience um, encourages inclusive participation. So getting voices, getting people from lots of different backgrounds to participate. Um, on the other hand, or in parallel, we don't want to direct the conversation too much. We don't want it to be a structured conversation. We want it to go 
in the direction that the audience wants it to. Um, so, and for ideas to arise naturally um, and for that conversation to be spontaneous. So there is some curation and facilitation uh, with the host who we've worked with in advance of the radio show. Um, but there is also, we leave space um, and freedom for the conversation to arise. Mm -hmm. And is this um, the input that you get? Is this one way you ask questions? Um, as some of the examples you've given, um, have you vaccinated your your kids um, against polio, for instance? Um, um, or is there a way that you actually could engage in in a two way conversation? Do you mean um, on air, like a two way conversation? Um, on air or um, the use of other technologies, text messages. Um, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the ways in which we would have that dialogue with between the radio host and the audience um, would be so the text messages that come in from that initial open ended radio question that's read out by the host. Um, we include as many of those responses as we can in the radio show so that the audience can hear their responses as an additional motivation to participate. And it also encourages others who are now hearing voices like them. They might hear, or not, you know, they're, they're, they're hearing messages rather than, you know, actual audio voices. Um, but they're hearing messages from people like them. Perhaps you might even recognize messages from their neighbors. And then we follow that up with the SMS communication. So for everyone that's participated spontaneously, that will also receive that follow up text message in which we're engaging with them and asking questions um, and sometimes mostly that is to gather additional information but it can also be to give them information on a particular topic and follow up with them and we use that channel to so with a with a series of radio shows that's ongoing over several weeks we're all continuously building up that database um, of people that are interested in that topic so each time there's a new radio show, we can let them know about it in advance. We can encourage them to participate um, and get that conversation going. OK, um, excellent. Um, uh, thanks, um, uh, Rainbow. Uh, Lucky, if uh, the next one is for you, if you can unmute uh, Lucky. Um, the question came from um, Olivia. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. She said, uh, well, I like the strategies uh, you are using. Um, in Sujas in motivating uh, youth to uh, consider agriculture. Um, yep. Now, how do you yep. also help youth to be aware of non-man-made uh, challenges uh, like climate change and how they might affect uh, and affect uh, youth participation in agriculture? Uh, maybe it's the right time also to say, okay, that Sujas is actually did start or is still covering a, a wider aspect for anything um, which is involving youth or uh, related to youth or interested in youth. Uh, Lucky, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, yeah, thanks for so, the question, uh, for the question uh, Olivia. Uh, I can hear myself. All right. Uh, thanks for the question. I think um, uh, what we do, uh, as I explained before, is mainly to make sure that somebody is changing their minds, as in to look uh, at agriculture in a positive way. There are these non made uh, challenges. Uh, that are happening all, all all of the time, and 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 mostly, as I said, what we wish to be covering right now and our new strategies is to give more information around agriculture and everything related. So there are so many things that are related uh, that are around agriculture. It could be uh, um, climate change, as you have mentioned, or it could be uh, the fall in prices of a particular product. So what we are trying to do is to make sure that whenever we receive this kind of information from either the partner organizations we are working with or from the um, uh, mainstream news, what we do is we share that information with our audience so that they know, yes, I like to do agriculture and these are the challenges and this is how I can combat, I, 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 can, I can actually uh, go around these challenges. So after building up that love towards agriculture then all these other challenges that are coming uh, can 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 be uh, overcome well 
after knowing how to do it, uh, how to actually go around the challenges and see the profit potential from agriculture, regardless of all these non-made uh, challenges that always happen. So we also make make sure that we give this information to them. It's not just that we, we are telling them there's no challenges in agriculture. No, we tell them these are the challenges. Even the stories that we have, most of them, we make sure that they tell us their challenges and how they, they, they go around the challenges and how they make it uh, at the end. So our stories uh, involve motivations, involve um, information, and uh, everything else that is in, uh, that, that is related to that particular topic. I don't know if I've answered your question. Yeah, and then uh, the, the topics that you want to cover is this, um, are you trying to focus on real practical uh, issues, like you give examples of impact stories or um, how a person is using agriculture? How do you tackle the, the wider issues, such as, for instance, uh, climate change and the effect of climate change in agriculture? Uh, or do you uh, go and take specific examples of people and how they're dealing yeah. with it? So yeah. how do you deal with generic um, uh, issues? So as I said before, we give a lot of information to our funds. We make sure that they are, they are aware of all these challenges around. And also we create conversations. We are not experts. We are just a media production house. And we make sure that these young people who are following us, they are there. Uh, to listen to us and hear whatever is happening uh, on a particular uh, area or a particular sector. So if it's about agriculture, we make sure that they know everything around agriculture. And we also welcome a lot of other experts. So in our, uh, in our shows, almost every week we have somebody um, as an expert to give that technical information uh, and also to give this information around all these um, challenges that are happening and how to actually overcome the challenges. So giving more information and also inviting our, uh, a lot of experts to, to, to deal with these generic challenges that are happening in the agriculture sector. Um, and uh, good enough is we, we are working with a lot of other organizations uh, um, which, which, which have all this information that we need. So most of the times we make sure that we are together, we work together with these other organizations. If we have, we, if we're getting technical questions, we ask them and we share this information back. And mainly we keep creating this conversation going around our social media and our feedback channels. And sometimes we get um, answers from the fans themselves. So for example, if uh, a fan from this particular area has uh, faced this particular challenge and they post on our social media and somebody else from the other area just said like, I had the same kind of challenge and I, I, and I faced it this way. So we tell that story, those stories uh, through our media and through that the fans get to know how to do and what to do where. And if they have more questions, then we invite these experts and they give information towards all these challenges and how to do what at what time. Yeah, so I, I guess the probably the, the, the key factor and probably the, the key success factor also of uh, Shujaz is to, to keep it real, to keep, um, you know, put the, vo the, yes. the voices of the individuals yes. in there, be it the public, um, um, you know, or different uh, fictional uh, characters. Um, um, yes, thank not you. To make programs, mm. not programs on generic issues, but put the, the practical uh, uh, um, uh, faces in there. Yes. So we have all these case studies. So when we tell the story, it's not just our characters. So our characters have been made. We, we have created these characters uh, to represent a particular, uh, to, to, to present the youth. So they are youth of different kind, and our characters are, are uh, of different kind as well. And through these characters, the fans uh, uh, grow the trust, you know, so, for example, uh, DJT and DJB uh, in Kenya and Tanzania, we've been getting a lot of other questions which cannot be actually aired through other channels. Or, you, you know, you find some young people can't even ask their parents, but they come and ask DJT or they come and ask DJB. So they also have this trust uh, towards the characters. So these characters have been built. Uh, they have these diverse characteristics so that every young people in East Africa can see themselves in, in one or two, or two uh, all, all of the characters somehow. And then uh, through these characters, we also tell the real life stories. So we have, we, we are, we are featuring a lot of real life case studies, 
uh, the ones that have given examples uh, from my presentation, and we have a lot of other uh, case studies that we can share uh, that we are telling their stories, and a lot of other young people can actually see themselves within these case studies, the real life case studies, and start doing something. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Loki. I'm switching over to Karen. Uh, Karen, if you could unmute. Um, it's, I would like to, to, to go further on your experience um, with um, trying to bring programs where you want to transfer knowledge, um, um, particularly in your area, let's say the farming community. Um, are, are there secret uh, formula of success? Um, like Sujas, do you put the faces in there? Do you give the, the examples, um, um, the impact stories or the success stories? Um, what is your, share your, your secret of success? of bringing a topic which is a more generic topic um, uh, to the farming community. Okay. Um, well, there's, there's kind of no one secret. It's, it's probably a formula and different types of formula will work in different countries. But I think some of the key things that we have used before are to have um, a core story, what we call a core story. So we will try to follow one farmer through throughout a season or throughout um, the activities that we're that we're discussing. For example, um, you know we'll check in with them every couple of weeks, see what's happening. Um, it can either be sort of live or it can be a story that, of a farmer and um, how they operated in the previous season, for example. Um, the key thing is to keep it entertaining. I remember Ricardo's presentation mentioned uh, it being entertaining, so. You know, sometimes uh, ideas like fertilizer application rates, they're not very entertaining. So we have to have a, you know, we have to, as communications experts, we have to find a way to keep that content um, interesting and keep people focused. So a key way to do that is to share experiences and share stories. But also there's the idea of drama. You know, we've done um, quite a lot of drama programs uh, to try and reach women, to try and keep it entertaining, um, you know, because people will listen to it for the for the drama value, but they and they don't realise they're learning at the time. So um, I think the interaction helps as well. Being able to ask a question and have it answered on the radio is is for a lot of people that's quite an amazing thing. So you know, it's a combination of different things. It's about being creative. It's about using characters and stories. I think. Yeah, which relates to, to, to the question also that Lancelot uh, asked, um, um, you know, what are the keys for a, a success for our popular uh, community radio? And, and as you said, it's, it's a combination of different things. Uh, the topic, um, as Lancelot said, um, um, the, um, the quality of the presenter, probably uh, keeping it entertained, uh, probably also the way giving the opportunity to interact, that would be a major factor also, Karen, no? Yes, yes, exactly, exactly, especially with community radios. Um, and getting the presenters out to talk to the farmers and to gather interviews, record interviews, and take them back to the studio. You know, it's it's really interesting when you when you visit with a presenter and he open he or she opens their mouth and suddenly people realise they know the voice, but they've never met the person before. You know, so that's really great when uh, when you're in a community radio, you can have that um, close contact with your audience, which is great. Okay, I'll come back to you in, in just a moment, um, uh, Karen. I'll, I would like to switch uh, back again to uh, to Ricardo. Um, and it's a question that came up um, on um, um, in several questions. Um, it is the issue, I think the multi-billion dollar question of reach and impact. Uh, Ricardo, um, according to you, what is the definition, your definition of uh, reach um, uh, for a community radio or um, a farming radio? One. And secondly, probably even more important, um, is how do you measure impact um, of uh, your programs, of your community radio, of your farm radio? Um, Ricardo, go ahead. And you will need to unmute. Yeah. 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 Okay. No, okay. As, as far as uh, uh, reach is concerned, I, I imagine what is meant. You know, how do you um, how do you um, reach different communities? How do you know? How do you get to them? Um, but but imagine it, it's also a, an issue of uh, access. I mean, some people would like to listen to uh, certain programs that interest them, but uh, maybe they're not. Uh, and they do not have the facilities, uh, or as uh, 
um, some of the participants participants mentioned you know uh how are the programs timed you know maybe you know the program that would interest them uh is um broadcasted at the time when maybe they're involved with uh, uh working in in the fields you know or um um or do not have access to a radio um access for instance uh, at least from our experience is also uh with regards to issues of gender uh sometimes the the radio the receiver is usually owned and used by um, one member of the uh the household usually the man so um women sometimes are excluded uh, or do not have the opportunity to uh to use this medium so uh again i at the risk of becoming redundant uh, a needs assessment of you know what the information needs and habits are is is very important in order to uh, to focus your uh, uh your programs and also to adapt to the listening habits of your uh, audiences um sorry I, I forgot your second uh, uh your second question it's, it's uh, on on it's it's on on impact so you have reach um, um yes, okay. which you clarify it's not just the amount of people that you reach but it's also are those people part of your target audience um uh, you know so it's more the quality reach um uh, rather than a global uh, number of people who have listened because they might not be your target uh, audience but yes. then going in yes. impact um um for the programs that we bring how do we measure impact? How do we measure? Um, one of the um, uh, participants asked, uh, how do you measure a change in behavior uh, if this is what the purpose is for a set of radio programs? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes, of course, uh, change uh, in behavior is, is not very easy to, uh, uh, to measure, particularly when you're dealing with the media. Also because, uh, okay, it, it's easy to measure, you know, how many people listen to a, a specific program, and um, but it's very difficult to uh, to measure how many of those people have been influenced up by that particular program. Also, let's not forget that with the media, uh, we do not um, we do not have the tools to measure impact immediately. Um, change is usually measured over a certain period of time, and this time sometimes could even be years. Um, so yeah. can I, it's can not... I say that a bit, Peter? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Karen. Um, um, Ricardo, um, uh, uh, just a second, Ricardo, can you, can you after uh, you, I would like to switch back to Karen. Sure, uh, go sure, ahead, Ricardo. Okay. okay, Karen, it's all yours. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, uh, yeah, it is indeed difficult to measure impact and changes in behavior with, with radio and communication, but that's what Farm Radio is trying to do. You know, when we run uh, on a project basis with donors such as USAID or IFAD or IDRC or, you know, the, the usual suspects, then they very much want to know numbers. They want to know how many people we've reached and they want to know exactly uh, what impact that's had. So we've developed some outcome evaluation methods where, um, we can try to measure the number of people who actually listened and then try and see of those who actually listened what they've changed um, in terms of their knowledge and in terms of their behavior. So that's, um, I mean, when you, when you talk about behavior change, that's the language of health, really, of health interventions, whereas in terms of agricultural interventions, we more often talk about adoption. So um, adoption again it's a difficult term because it looks at, at long term but we, so we often talk about changing practices or trying out a new practices trying out a new practice so um of of maybe 30 projects over the last 10 years we've got average numbers of um people who will start to try a new practice after having heard a radio series and by series that's usually three or four months of of programs so it is complicated and it's messy, as in you know many things in agricultural development. But it's uh, we are trying to do that. And the, I mean the average figures we have for all those projects and um, the work we've done is that around 20% of regular listeners will start to try out a new practice after having heard about it and discussed it on radio. So for an extension method, it's quite high. 
Mm -hmm. And how do you measure this? Um, do you, uh, for instance, when people send in um, uh, SMS messages, do you contact them? Do you do a, a kind of a survey? Um, um, no, how do you measure no. adoption? Go ahead. It's a full outcome survey. So it's a face-to-face -face household uh, survey, you know, with a full questionnaire. Um, we use uh, what we, what's known as Mobenzi software. So you can type the answers into kind of a mobile phone-based platform and they all zoom off to a website where it's easy to analyze them. So, um, yeah, that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fully structured, rigorous type of outcome that's done with face-to-face -face questionnaires. And we've had that um, method assessed by people such as Align, one of the uh, monitoring and evaluation consultancy in the UK. So um, it's by no means perfect, but uh, it, it's, it gives us a very good estimation. Mm -hmm. And you spoke about the um, the outcome evaluation, the, the measures and the process, the methods that you follow. Uh, is this public, uh, Karen? Um, can we have access to that? Um, I pr uh, probably yes. I can check with uh, with the powers that be in Farm Radio International. I can share that. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, keep a note of it. I, I wrote it down. Maybe something that we can um, add uh, if there is a link to a resource material um, uh, that we can add to the, the wrap up uh, email that we sent uh, to people. Um, before Thanks. I go uh, back um, to uh, Rainbow, I have one more question for you. Um, the gender issue. Um, a question from Annette combined with a, um, um, a remark from Lancelot. And it said, um, you've mentioned um, that radio can reach uh, masses of people and give um, uh, and, and gave an example of Ethiopia, where farm radio is reaching large audiences. Now, in 2015, uh, and it says I conducted a study in Ethiopia and was surprised to learn that radio was not amongst the top two sources of agriculture information, particularly um, the women ranked fourth for the women. It ranked fourth or fifth as a source. The main reason was that the content is not in line with their interest, um, she says. Now, what are your projects um, um, uh, doing to address this? The accessibility of, of uh, women um, uh, on radio, as well as, um, um, or, or is it a question of, is the medium not attractive to, to women? Combined um, with this, a question from Lancelot, uh, how do you increase uh, women's participation in radio broadcast? And we touched this before, women most of the time appear more as those who receive the information, those who give the information or share experiences or might not have access to a radio in many communities. Um, still yours, uh, Karen. Sure, thanks. Um... Yeah, I mean, there's two parts to the question, I suppose. The one about uh, making sure the content is relevant to the community. Um, I think it was uh, Lucky who spoke about doing some ground truthing, and that's one of the things that, that we insist on doing before we even start to work with the radio station, is to go and um, talk to the potential audience. You know, quite often when we're working on a project basis, we'll have... Um, partners who come to us and say, we want more people to grow orange sweet potato, for example. So in a sense, the topic that you're dealing with is predetermined because of the nature of, of, uh, of what we do. But, but um, it's, you know, the devil's in the details where we then go to the audience and say, what do you know about orange potato? Um, is it good for you? How do you grow it? Where do you get the vines? And all the detail about agronomy and so on and so on. So that then we make sure that the, the content can be tailored to the audience in that sense. Um, I think the second part of the question was about women. Um, yeah, it's a big it's a big issue because a lot of the time women are those women are very involved in farm work, but um, it's harder for them to have access to the information because of um, Either they don't have access to the radio because the man has it or because they don't have batteries, they don't have money for batteries, um, etc. So one of the things we've done uh, is to encourage women's listeners groups and maybe supply them with a radio that they can uh, record the programs on and then listen to when they need. We've also experimented with things like women's hotlines, so a call-in number for women only. So, you know, often if women can't get through, they'll give up. But um, if a man gets through, he may well keep trying. So we've, we've experimented with those. Um, and we've also run some what we call Her Farm Radio projects, where we've given the broadcasters gender awareness trainings. And um, we've, had a, we've had the weekly 
interactivity question focused on a gender issue. So rather than saying, um, what kind of weeding do you do? We would say, who is doing the weeding this week? So that then it would bring up, um, you know, some, some women focused or some gender focused issues for discussion. So in that way, that, that tends to bring women into the program a little bit more. And also um, drama, women love, tend to, tend to react, react really well to the drama. So that's another, it's another method of reaching out. Mm -hmm. uh, what according to you would be the most uh, restrictive factor uh, would be um, uh, women not having physically access to the radio? Uh, or would it be to uh, make topics which are uh, geared towards women, uh, getting women interested in the topics and giving them a way to, uh, to interact? Is it a, a, a purely physical access restriction to the radio or does it vary community to, commu to community? Um, Go ahead, Karen. I think that having, having purely physical access to the radio is a big thing. It's a big thing and it's hard to get around, you know, no matter what we do. Um, now with the growth of mobile phones it's getting slightly easier but um yeah i mean it depends which country and which community you're in last week i was in mozambique and women there are reporting very low access to radio whereas here in tanzania it's much higher so it is very site specific and um it's a difficult one to get around Mm -hmm. um, and I think you also with Farm Radio, um, you have uh, projects where you provide physical um, uh, radios to um, uh, women, women, women communities, uh, women cooperatives. Yes. Yeah. With the listeners groups, we've um, subsidized uh, solar powered MP3 recordable radio sets so that, you know, it's trying to get around the access issue, but also trying to get around the battery, having batteries. It's, it's a wind up radio. I think they're made by a company called Free Player or Free Play, maybe. Um, but they have a tiny solar panel at the top. Um, you can record programs onto an SD card. You can even charge your mobile phone from it. So it's it, it's a handy little device that has a number of um, uh, what do you call it things that it can do. Um, but yeah, we we tend to subsidise that, and they're not so easily available. Uh, on the market, which is a bit, uh, which is a bit of a shame. So there may be a business opportunity in there if anybody's uh, interested in that. Yep, uh, very good. Thanks, um, Karen. Um, I'm switching over to uh, Rainbow. Uh, Rainbow, the gender issue is coming your way. Um, um, something that came in also on the chat box. Um, when you do research and you use um, a radio um, for actual research, of course, defining your target group and your responders is really important. Um, as we uh, already um, uh, touched on um, now in, in the past five minutes, um, access to radio, um, the, um, the response of women um, uh, to, to radio programs uh, might be limited, might vary per community, might be um, a, a real restriction. Now, if you do research, uh, for instance, we're talking about, you, you were talking about research on polio, uh, where the kids uh, are vaccinated. Um, very often it is the women who are responsible for that. The women are responsible for the health of, of their kids. Now, how do you ensure that women have access um, and women are actually um, uh, the ones who uh, respond uh, to your service and uh, your research? Go ahead. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an issue we think about a lot and perhaps we can also move it beyond the discussion around access to radio or to mobile phones. Um, something that we've found through the research when we were still part of the university is access sometimes isn't the isn't the, the, the crucial fact in whether women participate in an interactive radio show or not. It's there's also the crucial um, factors around the social cultural expectations and beliefs and norms about whether women should participate or not, if they're perceived as being interested in certain issues or not. Um, so some of the things that we try to do to boost that engagement, and, and like you say, it's some topics may be allow more or encourage more female participation than other topics. Um, but there are always things that can be done to help encourage a more in inclusive and equal conversation. So we work with our radio hosts in advance um, to ensure that, for example, when they're reading out messages, they're reading out 
at least as many messages from women as men and, and hopefully even in more messages from women to give out that message that it's a space for all voices and for all people to um, take part in. We try to work with female radio hosts, quite simply. We, we test our radio scripts in advance. Um, recent work with Oxfam, simple things like scheduling shows at times that are most convenient for women. So doing that um, research and doing that investigation beforehand, just to be sure that everything is in line to, to boost engagement. Um, as well as in terms of, there was a, a question that came through in the chat box as well about cost of participating. Um, and for mm -hmm. our project, that's always free. So there's no cost barrier in terms of participation. Um, and hopefully that will encourage women as well. Um, and these are things um, I think can never really repeat it too much that the, you know, the short code is free, uh, that we want to hear from all voices. Um, for more people and um, yeah kind of repeating back or including women's voices as much as possible yeah which answered the question from uh, abhishek on um, uh, the cost of sms and calls in in somalia so um, for when when you work um, uh, in those areas uh, you stress you make sure that you have the arrangements that is still free for the users correct sorry the arrangements that um, so when, when you do, for instance, yeah, for your um, your uh, project in Somalia, um, so you make sure that you have arrangements that uh, for the calls and for the SMSs, um, 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 they are toll free, uh, correct? Yes. Okay. So, 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 so far ahead. we we're analysing textual data. So the data that we're gathering is is um, just through SMS when it's an interactive radio project. We, we are also exploring other digital channels like social media and instant messaging. And there was another question that came through about um, illiterate populations. Um, and clearly, you know, if, if we're only looking at textual data, then that does exclude certain populations, which is why what was one of the reasons we're looking at um, interactive voice response, IVR. So that's I think is what uh, Karen was talking about, something that Farm Radio has been using and exploring of people can leave voicemail messages and there's you know, increasing technology and innovation around translating that uh, speech, to, speech into text, which then would be available to analyze as well. Um, so yeah, we're always looking for ways to, to innovate and there's always new technologies coming through that can ensure more people are included in these conversations. Yeah, so with that also you answered the question from Ellie on how do you uh, reach out um, to the um, uh, part of the population which is illiterate. So it would be through IVF. We haven't done that yet, um, but it's something, yeah, we're, we're actually looking at at the moment. And in, partic in particularly in relation to the work we're planning around agriculture. Um, as as was mentioned in the comment, it's you know there's usually a link between rural populations and literacy, which is why it's it's you know you have to incorporate several different channels um, to make sure you're reaching as many people as possible. And something else that we we like to emphasize is that our research is is most powerful when it's combined with other types of research, whether it's a household survey um or other more traditional means if you can combine that with our methods it, it, it um, provides a very kind of rich and robust and credible source of evidence uh, which is another way of overcoming that bias towards um liter literate uh, populations yeah uh, yeah uh, thanks um um rainbow um i would like to switch back again to lucky um on um the challenge of reaching your target audience and certainly making sure that there is um, um, a, a gender balance in your work um, in tanzania with sujas in tanzania and kenya um uh, sujas or in your past experience beyond sujas um uh, what was your experience in, in um, uh, one making sure that um, uh, women have access um, to the radio or the medium that you're using, and secondly, that they're also um, the ones um, who have the opportunity to respond. Uh, something specifically uh, you want to share in your experience? Yeah. So uh, the experience that we have been 
experiencing <laughs> is um, so women or girls, I would say, uh, they are not as active as men uh, or boys uh, towards the media. So even when you put a call out on a radio show or uh, through the comic or even on social media, you get a huge percent of, of boys responding uh, and girls are not responding. So what we have been doing uh, to make sure that we at least have the gender balance is uh, to, first of all, we, 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 as I said, we have cre um, created the characters uh, according to the behaviors and uh, the dynamics in the communities. So we have a very powerful uh, girl characters uh, through our media, especially on the comic stories. So we're using that girl character, those girl characters who are very powerful to talk to girls and uh, make them active, responding, uh, joining the conversations around different kind of topics. So that's one, uh, using our characters to make sure that they, they uh, spark that conversation among girls and to make them actually engage on something. Uh, but also, we, we have always made sure that we balance the success stories. So when we tell the stories on, on radio, if you're listening to our radio show today, and we have two stories, one should be from a girl and the other one should be from a boy. So we, we are trying to balance that as much as we can to make sure that even girls themselves, they see that other girls are doing uh, something and are engaging in this particular issue. If it's agriculture, they're engaging in agriculture. But also we have been having specific content for a specific target group. So uh, let me get you back uh, a bit. I, uh, you remember uh, during my presentation, I, I gave an example of this girl from Bear called Esther. So through Esther, we learned something that most rural girls, they have learned. In fact, they do have land, and they've been gi they, they're giving uh, they're given this land by their families to grow food for their families. So through that insight, we decided to to give information around how to utilize your land as a girl in the village to earn more money, not necessarily to make food for the family, but also to make more money for yourself and to achieve your dreams. So by insights like that. We make sure that we we uh, we encourage a particular target group to now start seeing opportunities around whatever they have. So that's another intervention that we're doing to make sure that we balance and and and, and uh, the gender. But also we have been doing segmentation uh, through our research activities. So we have girl segments, we have boy segments in different kind of topics. So if it's about agriculture, we have segments for girls. There are rural girls, they are urban girls, they are this kind of girls, they are this kind of girls in, in this particular situation. So segmentations, uh, uh, segmentation, it helps us to format our content so that it serves them uh, directly. It doesn't, uh, it's not a general content, but it's a specific content for a spe specific segment. And we do that on our radio show. We make sure that every show has a specific seg segment as, uh, for a specific segment, as well as a specific kind of content for a specific segment. But even these radio, uh, regional radio stations, the community stations that we are engaging with, uh, before starting with them, what we do, we also do some kind of research within that area and get insights from those areas and the insights uh, on a particular subject. So now we're talking about agriculture. So we we, we have general, general uh, questions around agriculture and we at least get to know where they are, this target audience, audience the youth in that particular area, where, where they are regarding the knowledge, regarding the adoption, regarding uh, agriculture activities and then through that knowledge then, then we can format messaging accordingly and all these community stations have a specific segment for them it's not like the general show goes to all the the audience in Tanzania so every community station have a specific segment which is serving them as, as, as a community but also we have co-hosts uh, uh, on our shows who are girls and this is mainly to balance because the main presenter is, is, is a boy, DJT. So we added two girls at least to challenge him on the show and to at least uh, create that girl power 
experience uh, on the show. And we also encourage girls to participate more, to re, uh, you know, to 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 send in their comments. Uh, DJT and these girls are reading out their, their messages a lot on the show, even on our, on our, our other platforms, social media, comic as well. We put a lot of girl content so that we make them active, participate. So that's how we we try to balance the gender uh, on Shujas for both Kenya and Tanzania. Excellent. Thanks, um, uh, Lucky. Um, I'll um, uh, hand for the last one to Ricardo uh, on, on gender. Um, uh, Ricardo, your views and your tips um, uh, on reaching uh, women, uh, physical access to the medium, um, uh, content, specific content. Uh, Ricardo, any tips you want to share? Yes, just maybe sharing some experiences from, uh, from our project, particularly in um, Mali, Niger and Senegal. Um, as I mentioned before, the uh, rural radio projects that we had in place were very interactive in, uh, in nature and a lot of effort was put into uh, working and recording um, radio shows in the villages themselves. Sometimes even uh, remote broadcasting you know, from a village where um, the radio stations would organize a village gathering with all the members of the different communities and um and broadcast from there and organize the type of uh, live show with uh, entertainment music uh, singing but also uh well-placed questions on uh specific development uh, issues and also agricultural and rural development issues um in order to do that the producers have to meet beforehand with uh, the members of the community uh, and to address that specific issue you know, of the gender related content, uh, they organize focus groups with, uh, with women, with men, with youth, so that all their uh, views are uh, collected. They do it separately because in some uh, contexts it, it is difficult to have a true and honest opinion from uh, members, you know, particularly when they're mixed, you know, uh, so there is a, a need to uh, to engage with them separately and and trying to get as much as possible you know the true version of the facts and all of this then you know is analyzed and some answers are tried are um, given uh, during the um, uh, the programs uh, so that they respond to the real needs expressed by the different groups. Okay, very good. Thanks, uh, Ricardo. I will do a quick tour of the four uh, presenters. For each of the presenters, you will get 60 seconds um, uh, as the final message that you would have to the audience that we have today, uh, which at um, the peak uh, reached over more than uh, 55 uh, simultaneous connections. So each of the presenters, you have 60 seconds uh, for your final message to the um, audience on either farm radio or rural radio or community radio or participatory radio. Uh, Karen, can we start with you? Your 60 seconds, please. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, I mean, I'd just like to say that um, I'd like to see more people using radio for uh, for reaching out to populations. And um, uh, just in general, I think it's a very much underused method, especially now that there are so many other, you know, ICTs and mobile phone tools that we can add in. So um, I just want to encourage its use. And if anybody wants to discuss further, I'd be very happy to answer emails or, or have a Skype call. Thanks, everyone. All right, Karen. And we'll provide the emails uh, to the present for the presenters um, to um, the participants in the wrap-up email. Thank you, uh, Karen, for your 60 seconds. Um, Rainbow, you're next. Your 60 seconds to the audience. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think continuing that point, radio is still king for many populations and part of it, the reason may, why we maybe we think it's outdated and traditional is also the reason why it's so powerful. It's, it's still strong, it's a way to bring communities together and also a way for communities to be heard. And if we can combine the, the reach uh, and the popularity of radio with um, newer technologies and newer channels, there's even more potential for radio to, to serve um, populations and to get their views and their voices heard and to ensure that um, their concerns, their priorities are put 
um, at the forefront of development, governance and ag agricultural programs. Excellent, thank you. Um, <laughs> Lucky, <laughs> Lucky, your 60 seconds of wisdom, last message to the audience. Go ahead, Lucky. Yeah, I think I would like to say um, we all know that, um, especially for East Africa and maybe Africa, I'm not sure, over 50% of population is the uh, young people, youth below 24 year old. So, and these are the major, uh, it's the big part of the radio listeners. So these are the people who are actually listening to the radio. So if we could fashion our messages through radio, in their terms, in the way that they like, through entertainment, through, um, you know, uh, co-creation made by themselves, I think we'll be, we'll be able to trigger a lot of conversation around a lot of topics and also help a lot of uh, mind shifting. So we'll, we've been talking about how to change behave, behaviors, how to you know shift minds and to measure all the impact, et cetera, et cetera. I think if we could focus on this uh, particular group of young people and then fashion the messages in their terms, in their way, uh, the way they like it, I think we'll be able to capture them and listen and actually do something. So thanks for, for, for the opportunity as well. Um, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll ha happily uh, respond to all the questions uh, after this uh, through my email. Thank you. Thank you, um, Lucky. Um, uh, Ricardo, over to you for your last uh, uh, final 60 seconds of wisdom. Sure, thank you. Uh, yes, I can not agree more with um, the colleagues who have uh, talked before me. Uh, yes, there is a need to support uh, community rural radio. Uh, in order to do that, we have to find synergies. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, there are declining budgets everywhere in most donor organizations, but uh, there are a lot of organizations who are interested in this or that aspect of uh, community uh, radio. So whether it's programming, whether it's the equipment, uh, what is the training, uh, we have to find ways to network together and find those synergies. Training is also important. Um, there, there needs to be uh, a lot more training for community radio broadcasters because they have uh, a lot of uh, tasks to uh, accomplish, um, not just technical, uh, but of contact, uh, of uh, social, uh, uh, social inquiry tools. So, you know, they need uh, to be trained. And one last thing on ICTs and rural radio, uh, ICTs have brought down the costs of the equipment, but there are also higher challenges. Uh, there is more, uh, the equipment is more fragile, so we have to find very creative solutions on how to use them. Uh, illiteracy barriers, uh, not just in terms um, in the, um, you know, in, in, in using, in, in uh, writing, uh, skills, but also in the use of the technology. And this where, uh, as Lucky mentioned, the youth can come in and help us a lot. So let's uh, attract the youth um, and make uh, radio more of a, a useful tool for them. Thank you. All right, excellent. Thanks, uh, Ricardo. Um, by this, we're closing off on the webinar. I would um, like to thank again, uh, Ricardo, uh, Karen, Rainbow and uh, Lucky. Uh, as well as uh, Amy um, being the person behind the uh, buttons today on the slides and um, the mute uh, management. Uh, we thank you all very much. To you, the audience, I almost feel like I'm in a radio show here. <laughs> to you, the audience uh, on our webinar, uh, we're closing our, our pre-summer series. Um, we're now gonna work on the past uh, summer or the post-summer uh, series. I'll give you a rundown of what we're planning um, from September till December. We have one last, uh, for this season, last webinar, not on communications, but on core agriculture uh, topics on agriculture and foresight. Um, uh, within uh, 14 days, I'll send you uh, details in a wrap-up email. The next thing you will hear from us is you will get a wrap-up email with the uh, link uh, to the webinar recording, which you can freely share with uh, colleagues and, and, and friends, people who are interested. Um, you will get a link to the, uh, the presentation material. Um, and then we'll need about a week to work with the presenters on a number of questions which we were not able to answer during the webinar itself. And with this, thanks again um, to join us in this uh, webinar, which was GFAR coordinated, but uh, together with uh, our partners and affiliated uh, organizations. Thank you again. Thank you all. And uh, we'll see you next time. 
will be in touch. Thank you very much.